G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. It is the 80th anniversary of Kokoda this year, and who better to have along to talk about that than Dr. Carl James from the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Dr. James will talk about his book, Kokoda, Beyond the Legend, and how the fighting in New Guinea from July through to November 1942 was some of the toughest of the Second World War. The Japanese were rolling through the Pacific in early 1942, and they seemed unstoppable. For the first time, Australia was virtually in the front line and experienced the effects of total war, with the bombing of Darwin in February of that year. For many Australians, the threat of invasion seemed all too real. But just how significant was the battle within the Pacific theatre and was Australia ever really in danger of a Japanese invasion? Find out as we talk about Kokoda Beyond the Legend. Hi, Carl. Thanks for joining us on the show. Good day, Thanks for having me again. Mate, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to have you back on. So, Carl, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do as Head of Military History at the Australian War Memorial? Well, in many ways, Adam, I feel like I have one of the best jobs in the world. Um, I'm employed as an Australian military historian. I've worked at the Australian War Memorial for uh, 16 years now. When I started, I had grey well, gray hair now, but when I started, I had uh, dark hair. I was just a boy of 26. Um, but the head of, yes, being a head of military history, I took that role on in 2019. And essentially, I'm now the manager of the team of historians and editors and the memorial's Indigenous liaison officer uh, who work within the memorial and support the memorial in its, in its activities. And so the things that my team do is we produce Wartime, our quarterly magazine. Uh, we research and write stories for the daily last post ceremony. Uh, which is broadcast on the memorial's website and social media channels. Um, we are curatorial historians or curatorial, well, uh, interpret curators working on um, exhibitions for the memorial's redevelopment project. So we have a lot of hands-on developing new themes and stories for the new exhibitions that will go into the new revised uh, memorial in the next few years. And then in our uh, and we also answer public inquiries and sometimes our media interviews, such as you know, doing podcasts, the people writing in the question about what their granddad uh, did during the siege to Brook. And we also review, we support government. Uh, and so we're also looking to review it, you know, the Prime Minister's draft speeches and messages and the like. And so it's really the role that we have within this section is quite uh, varied. And it's uh, a really exciting because in some ways you never really know what you're going to be doing from day to day, whether you're answering a public inquiry, when you're looking at or reviewing the, draft, the Prime Minister's draft speech, uh, or you have the opportunity to get into some really deep hands-on research. Uh, and it also means that we change a lot too. So while I'm a, I'm a specialist in Australia's environment during the Second World War, one of my new tasks is to be the lead curator on a new exhibition looking at the role of Australian Chinooks in Afghanistan um, from 2006 or 2005, 2006 uh, through to 2012, 2013. And so that's been a real um, privilege because you get to meet living veterans uh, rather than, say, looking at these purely historic conflicts. Absolutely. It sounds like some interesting work. And how long before that will be open to the public, Carl? Well, that exhibition will be at about 2024, um, and we, my team are really working on the exhibitions that will go into what we're calling uh, the new Anzac Hall, Anzac Hall Upper. Um, so in addition to the role of Chinooks in Afghanistan, there's also going to be new exhibitions on Australia's involvement in Bombing Command. So Jew for George will return to display. Uh, there will also be a new exhibition on uh, the Battle of Milne Bay, Sydney Harbour under attack, so the return of the Japanese Major Submarine, the Sydney, M Sydney Emden action uh, from the First World War, and then we'll also see in this new exhibition space, new exhibitions to the Iraq wars, Afghanistan, as well as peacekeeping um, and humanitarian operations and uh, Timor as well. Mate, I look forward to seeing that once it's open. So, so we're talking today, we're talking about the Kokoda campaign in the Second World War. And so when did you first become interested in the Kokoda campaign and what drew you to the interest for you as you were growing up? Well, for me, my interest has always really been Australia's involvement in the Second World War, and that's because of my grandparents' connection. Um, it was their war, it was their conflict they served, and they shaped my interest in, in history, military history, from day one, really. 
Uh, and then as I was pursuing my studies, looking into history, you know, through university, uh, one of those key works that really inspired me early on was Peter Bruin's book, Those Ragged Bloody Heroes, uh, which was published in the early 1990s. And that was a book that really talked about the soldier experience during the Kokoda campaign. Um, lots of quotes, lots of oral history quotes. And that was done at a time when uh, the veterans were in their 50s and 60s. Like they were, you know, getting on, um, but they weren't sort of the older men of the 80s or 90s or 100s, what they are now. So the memories are still fresh. It was a new oral history project and it was a very influential work. And then as I pursued my studies and working at the War Memorial, uh, in many ways, Kokoda is the big story of the Pacific. Uh, the physicality, the terrain, the imagery, the stories. And Kokoda is a deceptively simple story. Like it lends itself to public engagement and telling and reimagining because uh, it has a very clear beginning, a middle and an end. Um, it's tied to and it's become very much associated with Australian values and so it still resonates. And it is one of those actual words, it's really a word which now has assumed a different type of meaning. Um, more than just a military campaign, it's part of it very easily fits into that pantheon of Australian military heroes. So you've got Gallipoli, you know, Gallipoli, Kokoda, Long Tan, it fits right up there in a, in a way that a lot of Australia's other campaigns specific just don't do. So th that's really what shaped my interest in Kokoda. And you, so your interest was Kokoda, and in 2017 you wrote a, a book called Kokoda Beyond the Legend. How did that come about? Yeah, so that was an edited volume and it was a real privilege to put together because while I've just said Kokoda is a really important Australian battle, in the scheme of 1942 and in the scheme of the 19, in the Second World War, it is really very much a small, sort of almost like a fringe of fringe action. Uh, it's important from an Australian perspective and it's often talked about, but in the wider theatre of the Southwest Pacific area, um, it was one of many actions that were taking place. So you've got Milne Bay takes place at the same time, and then just outside of the Southwest Pacific area, you've got, you know, Guadalcanal and Solomon Islands, Coral Sea, Midway, and then later on you've got Beer and Like, there's just so many actions taking place. Uh, and then to put that into a bigger global perspective. And so what I wanted to do with the um, Dakota Beyond the Legend was... And the advantage of having an edited work is you can have lots of different contributors bring in their own different perspectives of their own area of expertise. So you've got people such as Ant Sir Anthony Bieber, um, who wrote a great overview chapter on well, what's happening in the war during 1942, whether in the Atlantic, um, the Mediterranean, uh, the European theatre, because by this time, you know, the, the Eastern Front's going on. Uh, the really big picture of the war and then you could drill down from the big picture through the more regional stuff so then the united states navy's operation in the central pacific so north midway or coral sea then midway um, and you could also unpack it too in greater detail about the fighting guadalcanal how does guadalcanal connect to kokoda you know so having people such as richard frank who's probably written one of the best books about the Guadal battle of guadalcanal is in a American historian, having him contribute was really fantastic, bring in these different international perspectives and to really unpack the Japanese experience as well. Because while Kokoda is a very important part of the Australian story, from the Japanese perspective, Kokoda is totally, almost totally forgotten um, from the Japanese. And while we do a really good job of telling our own story, so you have people such as Peter Brune uh, and the like who've done a lot of work looking at Australian experiences, in many ways, the Japanese are just referred to as the Japanese, like the other. You don't really drill down into the same level of operational detail or tactical detail from the Japanese. You know, what were the experience of Japanese troops from the 144th or the 41st Infantry Regiments? Uh, and so by having three chapters looking at the Japanese experience, how they trained, where they come from, uh, and, and what did they do, that was a great way to get both sides of the story. It's a good point that you touch on there, Carl, because it's something that we, we tend to forget sometimes that we only look at history from one side. We don't look at it from the other side. And, and it's a very key point that you touch on there where you're looking at both sides and getting both perspectives, which, it you know, it, it, then you can see it from the other side, which is it's, it's, it's so important and critical. Yeah, and in many ways, uh, as an Australian historian, we're suffering that we only ever really read and speak English. <laughs> Whereas Europeans, for example, often have <laughs> multi language, and often a lot of Japanese or Asian scholars will speak Japanese as well as English. Uh, and so that limits out in the straight from this as an Australianist, it limits your source material. And unlike, say, the European theatre of operations, particularly um, the Middle East or Northwest Europe, where lots of German um, source material has been translated into English, 
or there's lots of people who are English writers and authors writing about the German experiences in the Second World War. I mean, there's no way. Go into any bookshop and there's books about the Nazis. Um, you just don't get that it's from the Japanese perspective or into the Japanese topic. And even from, uh, and so that's why it's kind of interesting and still, you know, even though it's been 80 years since the conflict, it's still one of the key gaps. Now, part of the reason for that was the fact the huge Japanese death rates. Uh, and so you don't have a lot of survivors and you don't have the same amount of source material that you do for the Australian context. But it really is one of those big gaps in terms of what we know. Um, and it's still very much even now framed, our experience of uh, Papua and New Guinea is still through the Australian lens and we don't really, haven't come to terms yet with the Japanese experience. And the other big gap too is, of course, the experiences of the Papuans and New Guineans. Um, because again, while they're often referred to in the source material, and you know, I talk about them in the book, um, we have great photographs and film and the like, that is still really through the Australian perspective. So Australian officers, Australian soldiers talking about the Papuans and New Guineans, you know, probably it was the angels. We don't drill into their experience. And now, 80 years after the conflict, in many ways, their voices are lost forever. You know, their children and grandchildren pass on this oral history to tradition, um, but you're just not going to get the same level of detail, the same personal experiences. Often all we have is a name and a name of a bit like an individual's name and the village where they come from, but that's really about it. Yeah, I can see what you, I can see the, where it would, would it be hard to bridge that gap and, and because the content, it, it's just not there. So can you briefly tell us about the significance to the Australian public of the march of the Japan, Japanese through the Pacific and the loss of the 8th Australian Division in the fall of Singapore, not only as a loss of men and material, but for national morale and perspective? Yeah, so keep in mind, early 1942, Australia had been at war since September of 1939. And so for two years, you know, we were very actively involved in the conflict, we mobilised our forces, uh, we sent predominantly, you know, you the formation of the Australian Imperial Force, uh, you have the expansion of the Royal Australian Air Force, so the Royal Australian Navy also grows. And for those first few years, our war is really the war in the Mediterranean, the war in Europe, so it's a very distant war. And of course, in the on the 7th, or really here, it's the 8th of December, 1941, the Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor and in Northern Malaya, Southern Thailand, all of a sudden our war changes overnight. You know, this becomes a war in Australia's own backyard. And from December 41 through to January, February, March of 1942, it is just one disaster, one defeat after another. It is a, you know, we have almost like a, a, a cascade of these dominoes of just one defeat after another. Um, from the Japanese invading Rabaul in January 42, so you take Rabaul, um, you have the fall of Singapore on the 15th of February 1942, which is described as a strategic earthquake um, to sell James Holland expression. Um, you, fall of Singapore is the worst British defeat in military history. You have 15,000 Australians from the 8th Division become prisoners of war. Um, very soon after that too, Ambon, Ambon, Timor, and uh, then later on Java in March, fall to the Japanese. And so within those first few weeks of, um, first of six weeks of 1942, you have 22,000 Australians become prisoners of the Japanese, um, mainly from the 8th Division, as well as a few other smaller units in the Air Force and the Navy, um, but 22,000 Australian prisoners of war of the Japanese. And for their loved ones, they basically, from the perspective of their loved ones, the PR just disappear off the face of the earth for three and a half years. It's not until the end of the war that they get a sense of what's happening with the fate of their loved ones. Are they alive? Are they dead? Um, so to give you an example, for those soldiers who were captured in Java, uh, so Black Force, so that was in mid-March, it's not until April, mid-April, they get confirmation because they knew the forces had surrendered, they knew they'd become prisoners of Japanese, but there wasn't the confirmation until about mid-April. That's, so that's a whole month of to confirm who was a prisoner, who was missing, or even who was dead. And then there was this beyond that, just an occasional letter, maybe a wireless uh, broadcast mentioning a name. Um, there's this great absence. So those first few months of 1942 really are our darkest moment, our darkest part in our history. From a military and strategic point of view, Australia is alone. You know, the Japanese threat seemed to be unstoppable, advancing through Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, it's unclear in that first few months too, what our allies are gonna do to help and support us because essentially we are largely defenceless. And then from an emotion, uh, a private point of view, 
it's a, a time of fear, concern. Uh, and if you're a relative of a soldier in the 8th Division, just great fear and apprehension and just unrest. You know, it's almost like a sense of grief, but it's worse because they don't know if they're alive or dead. So incredibly emotional time from an individual perspective point of view, uh, a terrible time from a military and political point of view and it's during those first few months. And it's, uh, it's, I think it's very hard for us, even though we've gone through some of our own trauma, say from 2020 to 2021, it's nothing to what compares to what our grandparents would have experienced or great-grandparents would have experienced during those first few months of 1942. It was almost as though the unthinkable had happened. I remember when I had you on last year and we spoke about the home front uh, and you were you were talking about the like and it's a great point that you just touched on with back then as well they had rationing so then you as you mentioned in that podcast if you could just briefly explain again what 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 was happening at that point with the rationing yeah, so from the 41, we had had rationing from about 1940. So that was a limiting on textiles, clothes, fuel and petrol and the like. But from uh, 41, it gradually increased and from 42 onwards. Uh, and this when it really hit home. And essentially everything, all goods, all commodities were rationed, they were limited. And this was, um, so you had little, everyone was issued with ration books, ration coupons. So like little raffle tickets, basically. So if you went to the corner shop uh, to get your food, your flour, sugar, bread, et cetera, cloth, because a lot of people made their own clothes, all that was, was rationed, it was limited. Uh, and that's partly because of what we had needed to be distributed equally, rather than say the rich can afford to buy more meat or more butter than the sort of the working class people. Everything was rationed. Uh, and from 42 onwards, that really started to hit high and was ramped up because of this Japanese threat. Um, it's also, in addition to rationing, you have the widespread mobilisation of the militia. So this is a little bit like the Australian Army Reserve. So people called up, so they conscripted into the army, as well as by having the volunteers in the Australian Imperial Force. Uh, it's the time from, during the back end of 42, the Americans start to arrive in mainland Australia in large numbers, um, which is a positive, So, but we need to feed the Americans as well as providing our own resources. Uh, and you still have the attacks in Australian mainland as well as attacks in Australian waters. So as, as I mentioned earlier, Singapore falls on the 15th of February, 1942. Four days later, Darwin is attacked for the first time. Um, the, the large, it was the most largest and destructive air raid. It was the first of some 64 air raids on Darwin and surrounding areas from 42 to 43. Um, in total, there's something like 100 attacks to Northern Australia. During that period, you'd have the Japanese attacking uh, Sydney Harbour on the 31st of May, 1st of June, 1942. Newcastle's also shelled. Um, there are Japanese sea mines on the east and the west coast of Australia. Um, now ships are sunk such as the Australian hospital ship Centaur in 43. You know, this is this is really serious. Like, it's not just a, here's this conflict and a territory to Australia's north has been occupied, invaded. Uh, the mainland is coming under attack from sea and from air. There is this concern of a Japanese invasion or at least raids on the mainland. And during those first few months of 1942, it, it, this really does seem as though we're alone. Um, and so the rationing is part of that. There's also blackouts shutouts, air raid wardens. People are here in Canberra, uh, in the Rose Garden near Old Parliament, was called as Parliament House. They dug air raid trenches in the Rose Garden. Um, people in Melbourne put sandbags in the windows of large public buildings. In Wollongong, where my grandmother was a, a, a schoolgirl, they had an air raid shelter in the next, next door neighbour had an air raid shelter. You know, this was, this was serious. My granddad, who at that time was a young man, he was called up and so he was conscripted in some militia around about this time. Uh, he was issued with the, a Thompson submachine gun, but he didn't have any, any ammunition. You know, but that was the, the great demand, the real fear at this time. There was this need for mass mobilisation. And so the story is that Granite said, oh, you know, we need to give this Thompson submachine gun without him any ammunition. There's sort of no bullets. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And apparently Sergeant said, well, you just hit him, you hit him over the head with it, son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he had the uniform, he had the weapon. And then, you know, they so they mobilised the 34th Battalion. Um, and so they marched up and down the streets and their, their boots and so forth. And then Grandma, who was a schoolgirl, says so before they got married, you know, she would see these soldiers and that was reassuring, it was comforting, because at least it looked as though things were there. But, you know, this is a time which is still hard to comprehend. Imagine Sydney, Bondi Beach, with barbed wire along the beach shorefront. 
you know, with um, brought with barbed wire, with small boats being restricted because they didn't want the Japanese to take this, to take the small boats to conduct raids and operations. It was a time of total government control too. So this is when the federal government really assumes control as the dominant government agency within Australia and takes it away from the states. Uh, so it, like everything is happening in 1942. It's really the key year. It was something that I, when I read in your book, and I didn't know that the wind dam in Western Australia was also bombed. It was something that I, I know that Darwin was bombed, but I, and I didn't, and I knew about Sydney, but it was something that was very interesting when I read that. I went, oh, I didn't know that. So, so they, the Japanese were attacking right around Australia, not just, not just Darwin and Sydney. Yeah, that's right. So Wyndham's bombed a couple of times. Uh, Broome was hit in a very bad raid in March of 1942. Townsville was bombed three times between 42 and 43. Uh, Horn Islands and the, the, the islands in sort of Torres Strait, uh, they came under a repeated attack. Horn Island was attacked multiple times in 42 and 43, plus uh, reconnaissance, ra- sorry, reconnaissance flights um, and just the... The hassle, the hassle, but the fear, the apprehension, the concern. You know, if you're on the ground in northern Australia, uh, and that's from, well, from far north Queensland all the way across the territory to northern Western Australia, if you see a speck in the sky, is that a Japanese aircraft? Is it an Australian aircraft? Is it an American aircraft? If you're on the ground, even if you're an anti-aircraft guy, you don't know where it is. You know, look at a silhouette between a Kitty Hawk and a Zero. They look very similar. Uh, but that's the concern and the fear that really fed into this, this time period. And there's a reason for that because, you know, during this first half of 1942, especially in our theatre in the South Pacific area, it seems as though the Japanese are unstoppable. Is it true, Carl, that more bombs fell on Darwin over the... 42 and 43 than the whole of Pearl Harbor. Is that is that true? Uh, yes, but. Yeah, I like this, yeah. <laughs> That's where I'll be a historian. Well, actually, <laughs> so in that first raid, uh, some 254 Japanese aircraft hit Darwin on the 19th of February over two raids. One was around 10 a.m. and there was a second one at midday. Uh, so more bombs did fall on. The, the number of bombs was greater that fell on Darwin than fell on Pearl Harbor. However... The, um, the tonnage of bombs, so the, the bombs that more, more powerful bombs fell on Pearl. So less bombs, but the bombs themselves are more powerful than the smaller bombs that dropped in Darwin. And Pearl Harbor was a massive, you know, milestone, key moment in the Second World War. Darwin's not. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah so more bombs did fall on Darwin than Pearl, but there was a greater tonnage that dropped on Pearl. And Pearl was obviously one of those key moments in the history of the Second World War. Whereas Darwin is important from Australia, but it's from an Australian perspective. Um, but from the Japanese point of view, they just hit Darwin because they didn't want the Allies to interfere with the opera- the Japanese invasion of Timor. So they try and take out Darwin so they can continue through the Netherlands East Indies. Uh, and it's really just a little bit sideshow. So. so the Australian Prime Minister Curtin and the War Cabinet appeared to be expecting a Japanese in- invasion. And with Curtin cabling Churchill to request of the return of the 6th, 7th and 9th Australian divisions from the Middle East of Australia. Do we have any idea how these requests were received by Churchill and what was the initial reaction allowing to us to bring our troops home? Yeah, so that occurred straight. Um, so when I mentioned previously, this Australia was largely mainland Australia was almost defenceless. And that's because as I mentioned earlier, a train soldier, so the Australian Imperial Force, the AEF, the 6th, 7th and 9th Divisions, they've been sent to the Middle East. And after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, there is this re-pivot to, um, if we're in a British perspective, to the Far East, or for us, the, you know, the near north. It was actually Churchill, he wanted, he redeployed the 6th, well, the British War Cabinet, um, the 6th and 7th Divisions. They wanted them to pull them out of the Middle East and to send them through to, uh, to what was then called the Far East. Curtin, though, in December, so it was really Churchill who did it rather than Curtin, who started to recall the AIF. Um, that was, Curtin was supportive of it. But in December of 1941, Curtin gave a very famous um, radio broadcast to Roosevelt and the, and the Americans, where Curtin essentially says that free of any pain in the past, we look towards the United States to help us, you know, rather than our traditional allies with Britain. Now, it's called, described as Curtin's call. A lot of people often use this as a key moment when Australia, again, pivots from Britain to the US as our great and powerful ally. 
And while that is true and is a significant moment, in many ways that was just more panic is too strong a term, but it wasn't as, it didn't really forecast a long-term relationship the way people think about it today. So Curtin did this in the moment of concern and understandable concern and fear. And there was an element of panic within the Australian War Cabinet, wanting to always look to the US to help get us out of this situation. Um, but when the message was received in Washington, FDR, so Res um, Theodore Roosevelt, the US president, didn't really receive this very news or his request favorably. And likewise, Churchill was incredibly embarrassed as well. And as it turned out, Churchill and FDR are actually meeting at that time after the Acadia conference where they're talking about the future of the war. And so Australia seemed to be very panicked in this response. Um, didn't go down really well. Curtin now insisted that the sixth and seventh division would return, return to Australia. And that debate was really being played out. So cables are being sent between Washington, you know, between Canberra, Washington, London, um, three ways saying where they're going to go. While the con convoy, troop convoys, bring back the 6th and 7th Division was still at sea. And so that's why, again, it's such an anxious time because well, how are you going to send ships through Southeast Asia or through across the Indian Ocean when the Japanese are punching through the Netherlands East Indies? So it was a really stressful time for Curtin. The stories of him just being up all night, continually chain smoking. Um, walking around the lodge in Canberra and, and various other things, just really, and well, I'll puddle through Parliament House and Hotel Canberra. Uh, very stressful time. And eventually, FDR and Churchill agree or acquiesce to the 6th and 7th Division coming back to, to Australia. Um, but that's only around March or April. And there's a big meanwhile. Douglas MacArthur has also arrived. He's escaped from the Philippines because the Japanese also attacked the Philippines in December 41 and the Americans are there fighting and MacArthur's able, his way, able to make his way out. Um, and he arrives in Australia in, in, in March as well. And then shortly after MacArthur's arrival, um, you have the first troops of the AF in the Middle East, they arrive too. So from March and April, there's a bit of a, our spirits lift a little bit um, because it seems that we've gone through this darkest hour and with MacArthur's arrival, it's seen as a guarantee of American support, you know, that they will not let Australia fall and that they will invest the troops and resources into, into Australia to then use as a, um, a jumping off point for a counter-offensive against the Japanese in the Southwest Pacific area. But that's why that January, February, early March period is so crucial because it looks as though we could be meeting the Japanese alone. But once MacArthur arrives, we have that guarantee of Americans in support and debt, uh, and that kind of bucks up our defences. Now, the 9th Australian Division, so these are the guys who had held Tobruk at this time, they would remain in the Middle East until throughout all of 1942, uh, and they will come back at the end of, in early 1943. And there is some horse trading as to what assets get what, and so, you know, British send a division to the Middle East, and uh, there is an element, sorry, to the Far East, um, there is some negotiation as to who gets what. Uh, but by during 42 and by early 1943, all of the, the Australian soldiers of the AAF have returned back to Australia to fight in the Pacific. Um, but it's quite key that while we recall the AAF and most, but not all of our naval ships, there are still some ships that continue in the Mediterranean, for example, um, while they come back to fight the Pacific, there is a conscious decision to not turn off the supply of airmen we're going through to each to buy and bombing command to fight in Britain because um, they will still want to be, Curtin still wants the Royal Australian Air Force to play an active role in the war to defeat Nazi Germany and uh, fascist Italy. So the AF come back, the Navy largely come back, but they don't turn off that tap, the RAAF. So you mentioned the fall of Rabaul and, and the Japanese ultimately turned their attentions towards New Guinea. Could you briefly explain to us Australia's relationship to New Guinea up until that point? Yeah, so the Japanese take Rabaul in January 42 and Rabaul becomes the major Japanese base in the Southwest Pacific area. So while I've just been talking about the, the fears and the concerns of the Japanese attacking Bay mainland Australia, what we now know and what they knew a little bit later in the time, what the Australian government and commanders knew um, sort of at the end of 42 was that the Japanese didn't want to invade mainland Australia. What they wanted to do, though, was to cut us off. You know, so the Japanese plans for the large strategic plans are really to advance through Southeast Asia, um, capture the oil, capture the natural the resources of Malaya, of Borneo, um, take New Guinea as a way to cut us off, or take New Guinea as well as the islands in the Central Pacific and then cut Australia and cut New Zealand off 
from the United States. So that the Americans couldn't use it in New Zealand or Australia as a base for a future offensive. That's the Japanese plan. And that's why they wanted to take, having taken Rabao and investing in that and supplying a lot of naval and military resources. And from Rabao, the Japanese, in addition to taking into New Guinea, so landing it um, well, into New Guinea proper, as well as invading Papua later, uh, they also invade through the Solomon Islands, like Bougainville, you know, Guadalcanal and the like. So from, um, from Rabao, if you think about it as a triangle, Rabao is, is at the point and the Japanese can look down the Solomon Islands from through Bougainville to Guadalcanal along, along one axis and the other axis is looking from New Guinea uh, towards Port Moresby because they want to take Port Moresby to cut the strait off from New Guinea. Now, Papua New Guinea had been Australian territories. Um, we often refer to them just as PNG or often just New Guinea, to use that wartime context, but really they were two separate territories. Papua had been an Australian territory from the late 19th century onwards, um, whereas New Guinea had been a German territory leading up to and during, well, until the First World War. And after the First World War, the League of Nations mandated the territory of New Guinea uh, to Australia. And so that both New Guinea sorry, both Papua and New Guinea and um, New Britain essentially were colonial assets uh, and they were our, you know, our territory for want of a better expression. So who were the first units, Carl, to face the Japanese on Kokoda itself when Australian troops actually arrive and face the Japanese for the first time? Yeah, so it was really only during 1941. There were a small number of um, Australian forces were deployed to reinforce the troops were in New Ireland. So because it was a, a territory, a mandated ter territory, there were um, Australian planters there, for example. So some of the very first units on the ground were the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles. Um, so they were basically planters, or Europeans, who were there and joined the local military unit to create a local military unit. And then during the back end of 1941 and the earlier part of 1942, um, you do have a small number of military resources go from Papua from mainland Australia into Port Moresby. But for most of that 41, early 42 period, Port, Wars, Port Moresby really was a military backwater. It's very small resources and defences. And what units were there, such as the Militia 30th Brigade, um, which is a militia formation, they essentially worked, went to Port Moresby and they um, worked in the wharves, they built airstrips, they laboured, um, even though they were an infantry formation that included the, say, the 39th Battalion, uh, they did very little, lived very little soldiering. Um, a lot of their fortifications and defences were really around Port Moresby and the harbour itself, because you know, their real concern was the Japanese amphibious operation, because that's how the Japanese captured Rabao in January of 42. And so the concern for those soldiers who were in Port Moresby in, during the, the course of those, over those next couple of months was be, would be the Japanese were going to make another amphibious assault. Now, that's what the Japanese tried to do, um, but their invasion convoy was stopped during the Battle of Coral Sea. And so the Japanese troop transports had to turn back to Rabaul, uh, and that's why the Japanese had to think of an alternative way, which well, subsequently led to, you know, the landing on the north coast of Papua around Buringona to try to make their way across the mountains. Um, but during those first few months of 1942, you've got a small number of militia units, the 30th Brigade, you know, the 49th Battalion, the 39th Battalion, the 50, uh, 53rd, a few others, some anti-aircraft units, um, some squadrons of the Royal Australian Air Force. There's a very slow build-up from about mid-42 onwards. And the first raid in Port Moresby occurred in February. So it's very much in the front line against the Japanese. And so it would be incredibly tense, very stressful period during those months from, say, January, February, March, April onwards. So, Carl, could we say that the militia units, when they faced the Japanese, they were really learning to fight new, like, jungle warfare on the run and because they, they hadn't faced this type of terrain or, or this type of fighting before, had they? Yeah, that's right. So the, the 39th Battalion, they were the first... Um, oh, so there's also the Patton Infantry Battalion. So this was a, a unit raised in, in New Guinea or around Port Moresby. Uh, the soldiers were Papuan, but they had white or Australian officers and non-commissioned non officers, say corporals and sergeants. Um, there are also small elements were deployed in that north, north side of Papua. Um, but the 39th Battalion were one of those first Australian units that were sent to Port Moresby. They did, as I mentioned, very little training and even some of their military training that did take place 
occurred outside of Port Moresby. And the country outside of Port Moresby is open plains, um, gum trees. It looks a lot like the Australian bush. And so they're doing some maneuvers, some operations, and they're working with universal carriers, so armed vehicles and the like. They're not training or not preparing for intense jungle warfare. Um, likewise, what weapon systems they have is very limited. So you've got your 303 rifle, Thompson submachine guns, um, but they don't have a lot of experience using, say, two or three inch mortars, Vickers medium machine guns. There's just not a lot of those heavy weapons available. And they're certainly not doing uh, the type of infantry tactics that would occur two or three years later, places such as um, the, the Jungle Warfare Centre at Canungra uh, and various other places. So, in many ways, these guys were, and they're still wearing khaki. You know, they're not wearing jungle greens, they're wearing khaki with uh, short sleeve shirts or shorts or shirts that sleeves that are rolled up. You know, yes, it's cool, but exposed skin leads you to malaria. Um, they're still very much learning. This is not what they're trained to do. You know, they're concerned about the Japanese amphibious operation, maybe Japanese paratroopers. Uh, they're not really prepared to march across the Owen Stanley Range and to fight in the jungle. Pretty much Italian is what people often refer to, but the, uh, that lack of training, the lack of preparation for jungle war warfare, um, all these units in Port Moresby at that time, so that mid-42 period, they're all in the same situation. Because the Japanese, Carl, they'd had a lot of jungle experience, hadn't they, that, as they were coming through leading up to Kokoda, hadn't they? Yeah, so some of them had. So the 144th Regiment, which was really one of the spearheads of the Japanese advance, so the South Seas Force, uh, they had served previously in China. So not necessarily in a jungle environment, but they had been in active operation. So they'd already, many of them were already veterans. Uh, they had also been used in other operations in the, in the Pacific uh, before they go to Rabaul and then they deploy to, say, to Papua. And then you have another, another key unit from the Japanese perspective was a 41st Infantry Regiment, and they had fought in Malaya uh, in December 41, January 42. And so they were, again, combat experience formations. And the, the 44th, 41st Infantry Regiment did have a jungle experience. So they had, um, they are more experienced soldiers, and so a lot of the Australians in the 39th Battalion and the other Australian units, and better prepared for the jungle and tropical conditions compared to the Australians. And I think, too, in addition to that, a lot of the Australians assumed the Japanese were better trained jungle fighters. So that wasn't the reality, but the perception was such helped inform the, the Australians to be a bit unnerved um, by the Japanese. And certainly, as the campaign developed, because the Japanese land on the 21st of July 1942, the first contacts on the 23rd, then over those next few weeks, next um, few months really, the Japanese seemed to demonstrate a, a master of jungle warfare in that they were comfortable in operating the jungle, they could move during the day as well as by night, and they just had more confidence, seemed to have more assurance compared to the Australians. So what we should talk, Carl, it's probably a good time to bring it in, is what was the overall objective for the Japanese on the Kokoda Trail? Well, they just want to get to the other side of the mountains really. Um, so the <laughs> They were to land there in, in January, sorry, in July of 1942. Uh, a small force landed around Gona and Buna, which is on the northern side of Papua. Uh, there was a rumour that there was a road across the Owen Stanley Range, and so the Japanese referred to this as the Kokoda Road. Uh, and it was a small force initially saying it wasn't possible to send a large, like a, a formation across the mountains by foot to get to Port Moresby. Because again, what the Japanese want is to capture and conquer Port Moresby to cut us off. And the view was that if you took Port Moresby, then uh, we would just surrender basically Papua. So the Japanese land on the northern beaches, and then over time I reinforce it. So they reinforce their troops on the ground. Uh, the South Seas Force or the South Seas Detachment, depending on which translation you want to use, become stronger. You have infantry, you have engineers. Um, and they make their way across the mountains. And then they meet against the, the first soldiers from the 39th Battalion, um, which was the spearhead of Maruba Force, which was the code name for the Australian troops. Now, the, from the Australian perspective, they had been sent across the Owen Stanley Range on foot because they wanted to get to Boona and Gona um, first. They wanted to establish some airfields there. And with the view that if they occupied that territory on the northern Papua, then the Japanese wouldn't be able to use it. So in some ways, there's a bit of a race to get across the mountains. Now, 
our soldiers from the so that lead soldiers from the Thirty Ninth Battalion, they start off first. They head, and at that time, um, the Kokoda Trail didn't have a name. It was really just one of many foot tracks across the mountain. It was unclear to the Australian commanders, so Morris and Rao, if you could even send a large number of soldiers across the mountains. And so when they were sent across, they weren't. They didn't take their heavy weapons with them. You know, they really just had wherever they could carry on their back, their rifles, the submachine guns, you know, your, your brain, which is a light machine gun, and that was it. The, the heavy weapons, so again, their Vickers medium machine guns and the mortars, they were to be in a ship and that was going to sail around Papua and meet them at the other side. Uh, but the Japanese beat them to it. So that's why there's that clash. And so why, uh, and why the 39th Battalion, when they're making their way across the mountains and when they're fighting at Dakota, and then later on in Sarawak, why they don't have their heavy weapons with them. So can you just give the listener a brief description of what the what the terrain's like and what the actual conditions were like on the on the trail? Yeah, so the Kikoto Trail itself, it's 90, 96 kilometres long. Uh, it cuts across the spine of the Owen Stanley Range. So if you think of Papua, it looks a little bit like a boot at the bottom end of New Guinea. Uh, and the Owen Stanley Range is basically essentially the spine that runs along the that divides um, Papua between the north and the southern parts of the island. Port Moors was in the south. Yep, Owen Stanley Range, formidable, incredible, uh, formidable mountain range. 